A different future starts with you. That's why GoDaddy does more than help you find a name. You can create, sell, and get found online so any small business can drive change or build an empire. We need a new generation of thinking. Your way of thinking. Start different at GoDaddy.com. Mithila, you are supposed to start the podcast now. Kunal, I'm actually trying to do a McLaren. A McLaren? Yeah, you know, a did not start. <laughs> <laughs> I should have seen that coming. Okay, save your McLaren jokes for now because if we start now, we will never finish. Never finish, you mean like the McLaren car. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, guys, the 2017 Bahrain Grand Prix, Kunal, it was an amazing race. We were absolutely glued to it till the very end. And a great show by Ferrari and Vettel to steal the race from Mercedes. Yes, and finally, Lewis Hamilton picked up a penalty for driving slow. Finally, I think this was karma catching up with him. <laughs> and I'm sure Nico Rosberg must have been smirking and smiling from year to year, you know. <laughs> I'm surprised he did not actually tweet about this. But uh, like in Abu Dhabi, even in Bahrain, I loved Lewis Hamilton's cheekiness. You know, at every point of the time, he was thinking of how to gain an advantage. And this is exactly why it is so difficult to beat him. Yeah, that's something Valtteri Bottas too found out, you know, about <laughs> Lewis. <laughs> Poor Valtteri. But Lewis's penalty was absolutely based as the rules. And this means that when you are in the pit lane, you'll be penalized for driving slow and for driving fast. So actually, you've got to just stick to the pit lane speed limit. So as it stands, Lewis Hamilton was the fastest and the slowest driver at the Bahrain Grand Prix. <laughs> <laughs> How often does that happen? <laughs> Usually slowest would go to a McLaren Honda driver, but this is a former McLaren Honda driver. <laughs> <laughs> So guys, in this week's episode of the Inside Line F1 podcast, we're going to do a quick look at the Bahrain Grand Prix. And a quick look it will be because we have lots of other Formula 1 news. And this news includes wondering if Lewis Hamilton has got an Arabic tattoo after the Bahrain Grand Prix, uh, what Fernando Alonso's retirement plans are, and a massive welcome back to the Turn 8 of the Turkish Grand Prix. So Gunal, talking about the Bahrain Grand Prix, I absolutely love to see the Ferrari team reciting their Italian national anthem with just so much pride and passion. They really do look like a new and reformed team this year. So, we laughed at Ferrari all of last season for wrong tyre strategy calls. And look, they actually made some bold uh, calls in Bahrain and they snatched the win from Mercedes. So, this is the new Ferrari team. It is aggressive and it is testing Mercedes in every single department. Kunal, in fact, you had predicted a Sebastian Vettel victory. So, I think you should just go ahead and say, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> I told you so. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Why did I give you that chance? Anyway, Sebastian Vettel's start and then his restart, that showed exactly the talent we've been missing all these past few seasons. He overtook Hamilton at the start, which was amazing. And then he defended Bottas' attempt to snatch the lead at the restart. Yeah, and uh, talking about the restart, so the Mercedes engine mode that we've all been uh, listening about, that was actually there at that restart. So we saw both the Mercedes drivers turn the wick up and gain advantage on track, momentarily as it may be. And we actually saw Lewis Hamilton overtake Daniel Ricciardo. I think Mercedes needs to get used to competing against external forces. For the past several seasons, actually, all they've had is internal battles. <laughs> I can't believe how they didn't respond to Ferrari's pit call for Sebastian Vettel. Well, well, and uh, it'll actually be interesting to see if Mercedes even pumps in the hundreds of millions of dollars that Ferrari can to claim and actually defend their Formula 1 glory, which could just be under threat this season. It could. Can you imagine? So Mercedes, they have the fastest car. They know it. We know it. The fans know it. 
but they've only managed to win one out of the first three races. Yes, you know, I know exactly what you're trying to say and I feel this every Saturday when I have to fill in my Grand Prix prediction. <laughs> you still predict right. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bit of a fluke and I'm a bit of a Vettel fan, but it is so damn difficult to make these predictions. Honestly, I am at an absolute loss when I have to predict where Bottas will finish. <laughs> and actually where Kimi will finish too, for that matter. The battle of the slowest Finns. Ouch. <laughs> but kudos to Valtteri. He finally got his maiden pole position in Formula 1. And he finally beat Lewis Hamilton to something, even if it was only on the Saturday. <laughs> Beating Lewis Hamilton, he'll remember this for a while. I honestly think that while Botas will definitely remember this weekend as being his first ever pole position, he'll also remember it as the first time ever that Mercedes asked him to move over for Lewis Hamilton. Ouch. The yeah. first of many, possibly. Yeah, and there, there was so much hope for Botas on race day. Everyone is just waiting to see him come out there on top, beat a Lewis Hamilton, claim a race win and then write or in our case talk about his progress and talent and I just guess that we've got to wait a little bit longer and it's a little unfortunate for Botas because you know he's joined Mercedes when they are actually under threat from Ferrari. But we'll wait. I'm sure he'll have his moment soon. Listen, I appreciate his honesty about team orders and how he chose to be a team player and give Lewis Hamilton a chance to chase victory, basically chase <laughs> Vettel. <laughs> I'm wondering if Rosberg would have given way like that, or even Hamilton for that matter. <laughs> Not without a lot of drama, for sure. <laughs> I'm remembering Max Verstappen <laughs> in his team order saga last season. No! <laughs> no! <laughs> and uh, I did wonder if uh, Lewis Hamilton would have or should have returned the place back to Valtteri Bottas since he could not chase down Sebastian Vettel. Because let's remember, it was Lewis Hamilton who asked for a swap. <laughs> Valtteri, if you're listening, please ask for your place back. <laughs> <laughs> but Mercedes employing team orders in the third race of this season itself. So clearly they're under pressure and they need to make their choice soon about their number one driver because Ferrari already have. Hamilton fans will always be asking the question though, whether could Hamilton have won if he hadn't picked up that penalty? And maybe, you know, if Mercedes had deployed their team orders earlier, maybe Lewis Hamilton could have been even closer to Vettel and challenged him even earlier. Yes, those are actually some very pertinent questions, but there are no correct answers. And uh, this kind of speculation only increases the interest in the season ahead. So please make sure you keep sharing and talking about these things because this <laughs> unpredictability is what uh, is what Formula 1 needs at the moment. And uh, that's what Bahrain offered. So it was actually a very good advertisement for Formula 1. But not so much a good advertisement for Valtteri Bottas. <laughs> Hero 2 Zero Weekend. Yeah, I know you were waiting to use that quote. <laughs> So he took pole and then he had a public relegation to the number two status in just the third race of the season. So that must be hurting him still. Somehow it just reminds me of Danny Kivat last year. You know, he took a podium and then he was relegated to not even the number two status, but the number two team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, It's not as harsh yet, but <laughs> let's see. I'm wondering though whether Mercedes covered up his lack of pace by blaming it on a generator issue. It seemed quite suspicious to me. Yeah, that's... Actually possible, so teams could do that at times just to keep their driver morales high and actually why not? It, the the, the Bahrain Grand Prix was also not a good advertisement for Red Bull Racing's brake supplier. <laughs> Max Verstappen, the very popular Max Verstappen had his brakes fail. That was, that was heartbreaking. <laughs> Strangely enough, I didn't miss him all that much from the race because, you know, we had so much overtaking happening anyway. Yeah, it was a gripping race, yeah. <laughs> but I was just wondering that despite his crash, whether he would win the Driver of the Day award. <laughs> <laughs> He's done that before, you know, Driver of the Day from a yeah, race he yeah. didn't finish. Yeah, all the Dutch fans, I hope you all are listening in as well. And talking of Red Bull Racing, they were in the mix, but they still finished about 40 seconds off the lead car. So they know they've got much work to do. But strangely, both Red Bull Racing drivers believed that a second place result was possible. In fact, Daniel Ricciardo took it a step further. They, he said that they could have actually won in place of Sebastian Vettel. That's crazy. That's very confident of him. In fact, in the pits, both the cars overtook Hamilton by the undercut. And we all know how important track position is this year. 
a podium might well have been possible kunal i'll grant them that <laughs> and by the way baby vettel pulled off an overtaking maneuver just like sebastian vettel did on the opening lap on the outside and absolutely defining stuff as for ricardo he said he sings to himself in the car <laughs> i was amused i really want to know what songs he's singing <laughs> and how he focuses on the race while singing you know <laughs> That actually must be how he keeps himself in the zone. I'd also love to speak to a sports psychologist. Sounds very interesting. But how I wish for a clean weekend for the top six drivers, and then I'm really waiting to see how mixed up the results could get. Fair and square. <laughs> But you know, these six drivers actually should exclude one driver because Ferrari seem to be forgetting that they have a second car. So poor Kimi Raikkonen. Yes, he's a little slower. I admit that. He himself will admit that. but the team is just making him seem far more slow with their pit calls <laughs> ouch and ouch i honestly think that kimi raikkonen is the only not so good part of ferrari's resurgence in fact this is their best start to a season since 2008 wow wow they won two out of the first three races but you know this is also where it gets a little scary because back in 2008 where they recorded a similar season start We know who won the drivers' world championship, and that was Lewis Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> However, for Ferrari, it was actually 2008 when they last won their constructors' championship. So that was also the last time Formula One actually had a mixed result in the drivers' and the constructors' championship. Which basically means that if this is 2008, uh, you know, back together for us, it's going to be a very thrilling season. It's also a very thrilling season in the midfield. Felipe Massa finished sixth again. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> full marks for consistency there. And the three Force India drivers finished seventh, ninth, and tenth. <laughs> and no, I'm not making a mistake. <laughs> yeah, I still think of Nico Hulkenberg as being Force India's. driver but congrats to him on his first points for 2017 good stuff yeah and i'm going to stick on to felipe massa so he of course retired and he came back and you know these cars are quicker etc but can you imagine massa's consistency so he is right up there when it matters and he's done that for two out of the last three races but that's also good news for williams i think it even becomes more important for the team given how lance stroll is not performing <laughs> Esteban Ocon he had his third 10th place finish in a row. Congratulations. Very cool. <laughs> so he actually started last back of the grid and he took the last championship point. What a fight. <laughs> so this means that 10th place is reserved for Ocon. He's done that 3 out of 3 times and then 6th place is then reserved for Massa, which could also then make me believe that first and second is reserved for either a Vettel or a Hamilton. <laughs> and the third for a Bottas or a Raikkonen so in the top 10 ladies and gentlemen there are very few positions left to play for <laughs> <laughs> i also think there's a special place in the barriers reserved for lance stroll <laughs> okay i'm being mean anyway perez had his 13th point scoring finish wow in a row he is super super consistent I'm actually disappointed that we didn't get to see too much of him on TV because he had this crazy run from P18 to P7 but some of the cameras didn't pick that up <laughs> <laughs> somebody must have pissed off a bernie ecclestone somewhere i guess because i remember something like this had happened to force india team back in either 2011 or 12 for the bahrain grand prix but anyway uh, finally uh, pascal verline he raced in his first race for sauber he finished in 11th place just outside of the points and can you imagine he proved all his critics wrong in his very first race for sauber and uh, he actually revealed that he had micro fractures so it's actually very good to have you back in the car pascal welcome back and in fact our best wishes to billy monger and his family so he's the british f4 driver he had a horrific crash last sunday and this actually shows us the dangers of motorsport and just wishing you a very speedy recovery billy And finally we're at the McLaren Honda Alonso section of this podcast. <laughs> Could all you can hear the excitement in yeah. my voice. <laughs> so guys, question. If your McLaren Honda and your two bored and tired of your DNFs did not finishes, what do you do? Kunal, you lodge a DNF, a did not start. <laughs> That way you don't get a DNF. <laughs> But still, sad news for 
Wandoon. He had a DNS. He did not start the race in Bahrain. <laughs> yes, incidentally, or rather, yes, uh, he was running on the treadmill while others were racing on a racetrack. So embarrassment for the team from walking in front of their Bahraini owners. Also, when you're at McLaren Honda, obviously retirements happen far too often. You can ask Alonso and Van Doon. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly why Jensen Button did not call his stint a retirement and called it a sabbatical <laughs> instead. <laughs> <laughs> but guess what? So Jensen Button is back and he'll be back for the 2017 Monaco Grand Prix as Fernando Alonso's replacement. So Alonso is going to go and race in the 101st Indianapolis 500 in America. And can you imagine for Sauber, Button is such a super sub to have. And guess what? He's even more super because he's going to be racing in Monaco without any testing. Wow. I don't <laughs> that's know if that's amazing. bold <laughs> or that's just plain dumb. But <laughs> we'll trust him. He's a former world champion. He knows what he's doing. And he's Jensen Button. <laughs> <laughs> Alonso's move is definitely very good for Alonso himself, but maybe not the best for the team or for Formula 1 for that matter. Yes, so the way I see it is the sports star driver will be racing in a rival series in a market the sport is unable to capture. And while doing all of this, he will skip the sports marquee event in Monaco. And it's actually quite sad for McLaren because Monaco could be their best bet for a point scoring finish. If the engine holds up, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> maybe this is exactly the punt that Alonso does not want to take. And maybe he is tired of all the chances to score points. And let's remember, at the Indy 500, he'll have a package that won the race uh, two out of the last three, last three times. And yes, believe it or not, it is also a Honda-powered car. <laughs> Maybe he's just finally choosing the right Honda-powered <laughs> car after all these seasons. <laughs> I'm sure Formula One also sees this as a good cross-promotion for itself, especially in a market that it's failed to conquer, the US of A. And if that's the view, there is no better driver than Fernando Alonso to fly the Formula One flag high at Indy 500. So oh, oh yes. that's great for the sport. Absolutely. Even though Lewis Hamilton is more popular in the United States of America, no better driver than Fernando Alonso to actually represent Formula One. And... Uh, this is also a very good step for brand Fernando Alonso. So a, kick, so a quick cockpit in Formula 1 is tough to come by and we all know why. And while Alonso has been patiently waiting for McLaren and Honda to sort themselves out, he is actually keen to build on his legacy outside of Formula 1. So, of course, he is going to be attempting the Triple Crown. So yes, all the best, Fernando Alonso. Kunal, it's going to be an exciting day for us. Yeah. We'll watch the Indy 500 and we'll watch, obviously, the Monaco Grand Prix. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, final words, actually, from me on Alonso's legacy. So uh, Alonso does seem to be up to something cheeky. And he's apparently informed the Spanish media that he'll give his 100% in the race for McLaren Honda, but will retire the car towards the end if it ain't in the points. And I can't bring my head together and understand why would he do that? I'm sure we figure it out soon because that shrewd Alonso brain, he is always up to something. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, uh, his radio messages in Bahrain, they were humorous and shrewd at the same time. <laughs> and they were bloody entertaining. <laughs> so, you can't end an Alonso section without actually speculating where he could go next. So, there are rumours that Alonso could go back and reunite with Renault and he'll probably then, I'm guessing, partner with uh, Nico Hulkenberg. And some really funny ones also indicate that Ferrari could call Alonso back to replace Kimi Raikkonen. But frankly, I doubt any of these will ever happen in the near future. And just to add to the whole Alonso Indy 500 story, Bernie Ecclestone has already said that if he'd still been in charge of Formula 1, he wouldn't have let the Indy 500 deal happen. So Liberty Media, thank you for that. <laughs> yes, and I'm not surprised because Ecclestone has marketed Formula 1 on its exclusivity and Alonso to Indy actually dilutes that very exclusivity. But more but if you're interested in more on this McLaren, Honda and Alonso 2 Indy 500 story, feel free to read about it on my blog, www.kunalsf1blog.com. 
Great. So now it's time for our this week in motorsport section. That's also my favorite section <laughs> after the McLaren Honda section. Could I we need a fun funner title for this section <laughs> next time? Anyway, so Lewis Hamilton got a tattoo post China. Did he get a tattoo post Bahrain <laughs> in Arabic maybe? <laughs> well, I don't think so, but yeah. By the way, Mercedes also tweeted in Arabic and it's really nice to see teams using the local language. Yeah, I'm waiting to see a team use Hindi to attract Formula 1 fans and I don't think we did that back then when I was in Force India. But anyway, talking of Force India, my first ever race for Force India was the 2010 Turkish Grand Prix. And guess what? After being kicked out of the calendar, there is a good chance that Turkey could be very well back on the calendar and that would bring back the turn 8, the classical turn 8 which a lot of people are saying the drivers would actually need to train for because it is an anti-clockwise corner. Wow. And uh, by the way this was also the first race or rather the first time I came face to face with the great Michael Schumacher. So very special memories with Turkey and No wonder you love Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> I am very glad to have the race back. <laughs> We're all glad actually. The Ferrari versus Mercedes battle has had their first victim already. <laughs> so this is Lauda versus Marchioni. <laughs> and they've already started taking pot shots at each other. And you know apart from the Hamilton Vettel battle on track, I'm excited to see how this battle goes as well. <laughs> And by the way there's a reason why Kimi Raikkonen won't ever go to the Indy 500 and that's because they served milk to the winning driver. And let's remember he's already got problems with the rose water servings at the races in the Middle East and and here they serve milk in America. Kunal Magnum ice creams are also made out of milk. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for tuning in everyone. We've had a really lovely start to this season and we've had an even more fantastic start to our season on the Inside Line Formula 1 podcast do remember to subscribe to us on Audio Boom and on iTunes for your daily or rather weekly dose of Formula 1 humor adios Bodega, 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 Alpha and Omega. <clears throat> Siamese sailors sell celery sandwiches. So wing about a serving platter. Hey, hey Jamie. Yes. Uh, did uh, did you want to try reading that line on the script there? Oh yeah. Let's see. Uh, you could save big when you bundle your home and auto with Progressive. That one. Yes. Yeah. No, I'm just not warmed up yet. Shouldn't be long. Detect a test. Indecent Bundle your home and auto with Progressive today. The marmot mangled my mushu pork pancake. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates.